is to stop Brexit. We believe that. to this country. Um, it's not only doing damage uh, to our economy, it is also doing appalling damage to our public services where nothing is happening, there is no progress in improving our schools and our hospitals, but it's also providing, proving incredibly divisive in our society. And we need to stop it and we need to stop it now. So the Liberal Democrats are not just a party about stopping Brexit, that is a really critical issue, it is a really important policy. But we are also a party who deeply believe in the rights of individuals. We believe passionately in LGBT rights. We believe in women's rights. We believe in rights for those with disabilities. I thought that that was all a settled issue. Thank uh, you, the interesting you. world. It's under threat. Please vote the Liberal Democrats to stop the threat and <laughs> 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 Good evening, I've represented you in the European Parliament for the last 10 years. I have a good voting record. I get a lot of letters from you. I answer them very sensibly and seriously. We put a great deal of research into your letters, meaning that I often get follow-up letters from constituents saying, Dear Mr. Agnew, we wrote to all seven MEPs, but you were the only one to reply to us in full. UKIP, as you know, is the party, traditional party of Brexit, and we still are. You may wonder what's the difference between UKIP and the Brexit Party. It's quite simple. The Brexit Party wanted to delay Brexit, UKIP wanted an immediate Brexit. My most controversial statement tonight, though, concerns climate change. I am a denier, and I'm longing for a question. I think we've established our hands by Philippe our first of our, our main questions, if you like, this evening, and the first is simply, do you want a people's vote? And we're going to ask Neil Cumberland of Change UK to ask that one first. Remember, just a minute to start off with. Yes, we definitely do want a people's vote. We want to uh, make sure that we have one and that we have a remaining option on the ballot paper, and we will be campaigning to remain when we get that vote. Absolutely, Peary, that's what we want. We must stay in the European Union. And we, must, and we should do so uh, because it is just so important that we recognise this is our nation's future at stake here. It is really essential that we understand this is going to last for decades. And the last three years have demonstrated that we cannot have a Brexit which does not do damage to this country and our people. Thank you very much. I think um, you know the Conservative Party position on this is extremely clear. Um, we don't support a second referendum. Um, a second referendum, in our view, would be extremely damaging to this country. We've seen the division in this country since 2016 um, that has been driven by you know, both sides of the debate, extremes on both ends, and it's vitally important that when you're given a democratic mandate, a message from the electorate, irrespective of whether you believe in that or not, you get on with it and you deliver it. That is our party's position and that is uh, what we will be following through. And it's mostly important that we remember as a society that these years of turbulence, um, they may not deliver the result that everybody wants. It's very difficult to deliver a Brexit that everybody's going to agree with. But afterwards, we need to stitch back society. We need to come back together as a group of people, as a nation, and move forward in the best way possible. <coughs> it's an important principle of democracy uh, that uh, the electorate that makes a decision about something should include all those who are most likely to be worst affected by it. Uh, the uh, referendum that we had on Brexit didn't include some of the most vulnerable people, the people who've been paying taxes here for years. So one of the reasons why we want a people's vote is because it, uh, we should be allowed to change our minds, we should be allowed to ask the people who are actually affected, we should be allowed to ask the people whether what is being proposed is the thing that they thought that they were getting, we should be allowed to explain why there are no unicorns. 
and for that reason we have to set out a proper referendum with a question that is clear. There were at least two kinds of leave, maybe three kinds of leave that were being proposed. There was the leave of the very wealthy who want tax havens and there was the leave of the very uh, poor and disadvantaged much, in Catherine. the uh, region. <laughs> Democracy's uh, basic premise that human nature is flexible, dynamic, and people can change their minds. There are studies saying that uh, one time political deadlines are one of the least democratic ones in terms of the deadlines that can be given to people due to various political decisions. Um, the freedom of Brexit, I'm actually exhausted about Brexit and wanted to end as soon as possible, frankly. Um, the idea of freedom is amazing that you know, we're both, we're both us are part of the vote for, for full time and ideas seem actually ludicrous. So, for me, a people's vote seems to be the only way that we can actually get to people. So, I am supportive of the people's vote. Thank you. Yes, I am absolutely a supporter of the people's vote, and I don't understand how anyone can consider that voting again is anti democratic. Uh, we have um, far more information now about what the real options are for Brexit, many of which were dressed up as all sorts of uniforms, as was referred to earlier. Uh, we, the, the, there is also the absolutely critical point that in a democracy, people are allowed to change their minds. We have already changed our government since 2016. It is three years ago now that the mandate that was had by the Conservatives in 2017, 2015 was to some extent taken away in 2017. Um, and we have to be, I have to allow people to look at whatever final deal is offered and say whether that is what they wanted when they voted for Brexit. So yes, we must have a people's vote. Thank you. If there is a second vote, it means there should never ever be a referendum on anything again in this country. Only one answer is acceptable. The European Union has formed on this. On five occasions previously, people in Europe have voted against further integration into the European Union and they've been told one way or another to vote again. We should honour the vote of three years ago and if it turns out to be wrong, there is nothing on earth to stop a political party forming and going in front of the electorate at the next general election and say, vote for us, if we have a majority in government, we will apply to rejoin the European Union. Thank you. Yes. <laughs> and uh, finally, Stefan. Thank you much, very much. Wondered if I was going to get the chance. Of course. Uh, and of course, uh, all this talk of uh, a people's vote comes to me really rather strangely because we've already had the people's vote. And everybody knows what the result of the people's vote was. There might, there might have been uh, a quite a large number of um, poor losers around, but really, until we've had the implementation of a very clear results uh, that we had in 2016, now, I don't think it is entirely reasonable at all. I'll say one more thing, which is that look at the people who are actually calling for a second referendum. They are basically Remainers. They are looking for a pseudo-democratic fig leaf to cover up the fact that they would really like to simply revoke Article 50 and remain in the European Union, um, but they know that to do so would be waving a massive two-fingered salute, not just the 17.4 million people who voted to leave in the referendum, but actually a large chunk of those who voted to remain as well, many of whom I have talked to and who now say, no, the democratic decision must stand. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to take some questions at the moment, but um, I'd also kind of like to pick up on a, on a couple of things uh, here with uh, a few of our panellists. Uh, Alvin, I know that you seem to be in support of uh, the people's vote, and quite often uh, we read the news on Cambridge Breakfast on Cambridge 105, and it's a news story such as senior Labour figure says there should be a people's vote. And then we get all the mess which was in the manifesto, this is going in and that's going in or that's not going in. Uh, you know, who, who do we believe? And the, do we believe a senior person or do we believe another senior person? We sometimes say quite contradictory things. Uh, what I'd like to say is that the Labour Party, and I'm part of this a democratic organisation. We have five hundred members, we have members proposing policy of national policy, and quite critical. 
the implied organisation. Um, we are a democratic organisation, we have different wide, wide variety of opinions. Um, but certainly in Cambridge, um, where MP is quite what commonly for Remain. You know, the Cambridge Labour Party is commonly for Remain, I am commonly for Remain. I know that. But if you look at South Shields, then the Labour MP uh, there might have a very different view to Daniel Sashner here. No, absolutely. Um, but that's why we elect um, members of parliament in this parliament to come there, there at the moment to try and propose the best deal possible. At the moment, and we may have disagreements about what that deal may be, um, but at the end of the day, I want parliament to pa pass a deal. And, I, and for me, I think the only way that deal can be passed is good with people's votes. And I think it's quite unfair for us to go, these are the exact terms I propose, as you do in Ireland, you know, when you do a referendum, they propose exact details about what this actually means and stands for. Um, so I don't think it's a contradiction that we have a wide variety of opinions within the Labour Party proposing um, what they think is best for this country and hopefully they can come to agreement in Parliament and make us a deal and that will be in their Okay, thank you. Uh, in theory it's 30 seconds, but I know I interrupted you so I was going to indulge you a little bit more on that. Um, I'd kind of like to also uh, ask of uh, Tom, if I may, uh, the Conservatives, as you said, want to deliver on, on the Brexit deal, but as we all know, there's been a little bit of uncertainty here and there. And so for those of you on your party who still, like many of them do, want us to leave the European Union, well, have another vote to confirm it, and then we'll be happy. Um, to take that, to try and uh, summarise it down, beyond the, the very simple answer that was given, a very simple question and the very simple answer that was given in 2016 would be extremely difficult, extremely damaging. We've already seen enough division in this country. It's extremely important that as a nation we begin to uh, stitch back together the society that we've got, that we move on from the Brexit debate and start to focus on the more important issues that are facing people in this country. And I hope we'll have an opportunity to discuss some of those later on. Yeah, we'll look at some of those in uh, a short while's time. I want to do some audience questions though, if we can at this point. Uh, oh dear, all lots of hands. Where are our microphones? If we get one person from over this side and one person from over this side, and then we'll take the person on this side first and we'll see what they have to say. Nearest, nearest. There we are, gentleman in the blue shirt. Is it blue? Just about blue. Okay, what positive vision for Britain's future in Europe can you offer to make it worth us electing you to serve as our MEP, working cooperatively, cooperatively with European colleagues? We would win the votes of those of us who, not, uh, who want not so much to take our country back, as to take it forwards. I don't want to go down the line if I, if I have to, but hopefully you'll get it. So let me start with Lucy, and we will, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll pick out a few just to, uh, to move things along, if you don't mind, sir. That's quite a question to answer in a minute. Um, I think it is really important that we, we look at what's happening, uh, not just in Europe actually, but across the world. And I think it is um, really, really crucial that we have a strong liberal voice speaking out in Europe uh, and across the world for the values that Western democracy has stood up for for so long. Um, and those are values of tolerance, of freedom for people to live and uh, worship as they choose, um, rights for all different types of people, and those are really being challenged across the world at the moment. Um, so I think it's absolutely critical that there is a strong voice in the European Parliament and a strong voice coming from Europe championing, championing those views, uh, because we're not getting it from other parts of the world at the moment. So my vision for um, speaking out in the European Union is for championing women's rights. For making, with, with the, the news from America at the moment on abortion rights is so horrific, and I just thought that battle had been won. Um, it is so depressing to find ourselves back having to fight those fights um, about the, the equal rights of people of all race, colour, um, gender, but we are going to have to fight those rights, and that is something that we're just going to have to accept. That that battle goes on, and that's what I would like to be doing to give you a team. I will ask Frank to ask Thank you so much. The biggest discrimination that affects most of us is going to be ageism, more or less. And sometimes all this is going to be discriminated against our future self. And uh, what I will be working on in terms of human mentality, which is positively free and vision, we will try to improve this inner restrictions that restricting our lives to flourish and make life as well. So the way I would reach this would be uh, an additional 30 billion euros extra yearly for advanced biomedicine and for all the other education and the construction projects to come up with a dynamic, transparent and 
and we have the regulation for our needs, so this can be accessible for all. And I have to tell you this earlier, uh, it's, it's global warming, climate change is one of the global issues, one of the big European issues, but health and longevity is another one. Thank you, Attila. Um, if we could, uh, I'll, I'll take some more questions. I'll try to focus in and narrow in on, though, on, the, on the people who spoke for the question. We'll probably get a chance, hopefully, later on uh, to, to broaden out our view. So, any questions specifically on the, the people as well? I'm going to ask the young man in red over here if we could get uh, a, a microphone uh, to him, please. <coughs> I'm assuming you didn't vote in the referendum either way. <laughs> Many, many of you are standing on the remaining reform ticket. So, what would you reform about the European Union and what do you think is achievable within that framework? Good question. I'll ask um, uh, Neil to, uh, to start us off on that one. That's absolutely a great question, and thank you very much. I think it's a huge amount we need to reform about Europe. First of all, too few people actually understand how it works, and I think that's a problem for the British government, let alone uh, around the public. So, for example, I'd like to see the Council of Ministers brought out to the public, made properly transparent, so what they decide is actually known about how they decided it. Second, I think we need to have, think about foreign policy and our views about beyond Europe. The great triumph of Europe was in fact enlargement, which was driven by people like Helmut Kohl, John Major, Franz Fromm, Mitterrand. That's the kind of thing we want to happen, see happen next, because that move basically altered the nature uh, of foreign policy in a dramatic and significant way, positive for your future as a young person, and positive too for the way in which the world operates. And last but not least, what I'd like to see about Europe is making sure that we really understand that by having networks across it, by exchanging information, by understanding the value of education across the European Union, we ourselves can make a huge contribution to the development of culture, to the development of knowledge, and to the development of technology, which in turn will make us stronger when we tackle China, India, and other great emerging economies of tomorrow. The European Parliament. It's so easy. Know. It is so easy to say, oh, we're going to reform the European Union. The Conservatives did that ten years ago and they managed to form a group, the ECR. Uh, and th that was going to reform the European Union chat. It is irreformable as they found out. The only thing they have managed to do in ten years, and that was overturned, was to reduce the number of times we visit Strasbourg from twelve times a year to eleven times a year. We we had a super sack of Strasbourg week, where we had a session on the Monday and Tuesday, a day off on the Wednesday, and a session on the Thursday and Friday. That was the only reform they achieved, and a month later the Commission said, no, that's against the spirit of the treaties, and you will never do it again. <clears throat> you cannot reform something that is designed on a ratchet process, where the people in charge are not elected, and you cannot dismiss them. Thank you, Stuart. Um, I will do one more question, specifically on people's folks, sir. Uh, yes. Okay, wait for the microphone. Gentlemen in the front row here in the, in the blue t shirt. Hi, my name is Victor Banyas and I live in Cambridge. Um, one of my things that sort of book me out in all of this is, is the accountability that individual politicians have and what they say. Um, I'd like to know if any, any party is taking any steps of making politicians accountable for the lies that they're saying. They, they, they're trying to normalise lies by calling them uni, unicorns when in fact they are lies. And I'd like that when we go on for voting, I'd like that people are accounted for, for what they say. Yeah. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, so Catherine, uh, should agree to uh, start off on this one. Uh, yes, so um, uh, we would definitely be in favour of holding people to account for their um, uh, what they say in their electoral campaigns. Of course, the uh, the uh, referendum has been under investigation for the amount of spending that has been uh, was uh, took place on the part of the Leave. Uh, side, but there are other aspects to the Leave campaign, such as the misrepresentation of the amount of money that would be available for the NHS uh, and uh, other economic uh, 
miscalculations which should really have been uh, included in the investigation. We don't have the right legislation for that at the moment. Of course, it is the case that had that uh, the electoral um, uh, uh, authorities had the right to uh, um, challenge the, uh, the referendum, it could have been... Um, Sorry, I'm not talking this right. But anyway, so the, the, the point is that because it was only an advisory referendum, it can't be declared invalid, uh, and yet it would have been declared invalid uh, on the basis of the, um, the, the uh, misspending uh, scandals and so on, had it been more than an advisory referendum. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, Let me ask if you're listening as well. Thank you very much. It's a very good question. Um, I think that the Brexit party is absolutely with you uh, on this particular one. Um, you know, it's very much yes. <laughs> we, I said in my own speech that the, one of the things that we were concerned about was the restoration of trust between the people and their members of Parliament. Uh, after we'd seen massive repudiation of general election manifesto promises. Um, and I quite agree with you that your mechanism, your mechanism, of course, is simply to vote them out. And the trouble with the European Union is that it's run by people who aren't elected at all, they're not accountable, and you cannot remove them by any kind of democratic process. <laughs> Let's, uh, thank you very much, uh, everyone. Let's move on then to uh, another question at uh, this point. And I was looking at uh, some stats, and it seems that the number one issue of concern to European voters uh, used to be the economy. Now, though, thanks to 16-year-old Greta Thunberg and others, it's climate change. So I'd like to ask our candidates what their policy on the environment would be. And we start off. Uh, by asking Tom on the surface. Thank you very much. Um, I'm glad that you asked me. Um, uh, just to take a step back, I mean, firstly, I'm, I'm extremely uh, in awe of uh, and the, the work that she's done in raising the profile of uh, climate change and the environment uh, globally. I mean, I, you know, it's going to be I, I, I totally, uh, I totally agree. Um, it's been an amazing body of work that she's done, and uh, for somebody of such a young age to gain such traction with um, international politicians is is remarkable. Um, I'm a little bit annoyed uh, with uh, the Conservative Party as a whole because we don't see the praises of some of the great work that's been done in this country already. Um, if we look at, for example, overall um, emissions of, of uh, climate change gases have fallen by 25 percent since 2010. You don't really hear too much about that. This year already we've had a thousand hours of coal-free power. We've seen a 37 percent increase in um, in renewable source energy since 2010. There's been a significant um, significant progress, but you know the party as a whole, and, and certainly I recognise that it's by no means far enough, and there is a significant challenge to the environment and climate change. Uh, the Conservative Party has a, a 25 year plan in place for the environment. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tom. Which I'd love to tell you about. Uh, there may be a translation on, you never, you never know. Uh, let's hear from uh, Catherine for the Greens now. So, we already have three Green MEPs in uh, the European Parliament who, uh, from the, in the 2014 uh, European Parliament. There are 51 in the, uh, across Europe in the Green and the EFA group. Uh, we've achieved a, a great deal over the last um, Parliament. Uh, we've, got, we've now got a target of one third of energy from uh, renewables by 2030, but we actually want to go for carbon neutral by 2030, so we are pushing for that. Uh, we have um, achieved a number of other uh, initiatives already, uh, and we have uh, phased out palm oil in biofuel, which protects the rainforests, uh, so there are many, many things that we can do uh, across Europe by collaboration. It's vital that we should be in Europe doing these collaborative things with our green neighbours. Green uh, politicians are elected all over Europe in a way that we're not used to here, but we can change it uh, now in, in the 19 to 24 uh, years Thank old age. Much, okay, we are leading in the polls. Thank you very much. And our independent candidate, Tilla. Thank you. So I don't think I can address the collectivism here a lot. I think we agree about this. Um, but uh, I must say that I think that um, 
planetary health should be backed by individual health as well. With this concept of thinking, if we get to live healthier for longer, is what I'm calling eco longevity. I think we got to be way more responsible to get to live longer as well. Thank you very much, uh, Attila. And we will move to uh, Alvin, Alvin Trump for Labour. Um, Labour Party is to uh, dealing with climate change, that's why we actually passed a vote in Parliament uh, declaring a climate emergency. Um, <laughs> we realise that this is a job being done in uh, world countries, and if we were elected, we will be uh, working with our sister parties uh, to well, can we make a commitment uh, from the party of the to be zero carbon by 2050. I think we imagine that happens to be stronger, we do more. The Labour Party has a green transport strategy, we find a proposed clean air strategy. So I think many, many different things to try and deal with the fact that we have a global issue that can be resolved with a couple of other together countries. Thank you very much, Sharon. This is what I've done. I agree with those voters who think that this is absolutely the most important issue facing us at the moment. Um, I think it's another really important reason why we need to remain in the European Union. This is an international issue. It needs to be dealt with with our European partners. Um, I'm really proud of the Liberal Democrats' record in government on this and locally what the, the Liberal Democrats in South Cambridgeshire have been doing, in Bedfordshire, there are all sorts of good innovative things going on. But the thing that's so frustrating is that actually we know so much of what we need to do to fix this problem. We just have to get on and do it. We need the political will to do it. And it is incredibly encouraging to see that this is now the top issue because that's when that political action might start to happen. And I really, really hope that the, the change that we're seeing across all the political parties bringing this issue up the agenda will make a difference because my goodness, we need it too. For you, sir. Now's your chance to boo the bad man at the pantomime. <laughs> uh, the, environment, <laughs> the environment really forces the three categories saving energy, stopping pollution, and this latest fad that we can change the world's weather. I'm all on board with saving energy, I'm all on board with reducing pollution, particularly of plastic, and it's a concern to me that the firm in this region has made a self destruct plastic and the EU, EU are making life as difficult for them as possible. As far as the climate change goes, this is a map of the world, you can't really see it. This shows the hotspots of CO2. And those hotspots of CO2 are all above the rainforests. None of the hotspots of CO2 are above the big industrial areas. This is a satellite map, and it's been taken by two different satellites and two different firms. This blows the entire theory apart. <laughs> But more, more seriously than that, in UK, we really do object to the way the IPCC is operating. It is completely undermining Thank the whole Thank you very much, uh, Stuart. Thank you. Um, let's uh, move now to uh, the Brexit party and uh, Edmund Fordham. I think we're standing in these European elections on the simple issue of uh, restoring uh, democracy and delivering upon the democratic mandate. And the question's on climate change. I know the question was on climate change, so if you want a detailed answer to that, I think you're going to have to wait for our general election manifesto. <laughs> You want regulations to make sure bad behaviour is stopped. 
You want the regulations to make sure that good things happen about the environment. That's how, for years, things have been done in terms of protecting the environment and other things. So regulations, properly implemented, properly decided, properly discussed are the answer. And last but not least, when I was in Parliament, I worked hard to protect Antarctica. And I got some legislation through the Antarctic Act 2013. I hope you all know about it. But the key thing I noticed when I went down there was that Rothera, our headquarters in uh, Antarctica, was basically like a mini EU. It had people from all over the European Union. Thank you very much. That was a great job for us. Well, I'm hoping this will be an opportunity for questions. Do keep them to the topic of climate change if you can. There's a gentleman uh, at the back, I think, with the beard. Get the microphone for him. Now, sorry, we have a microphone issue, and Rob is rushing across. I don't know if it's simpler just to move the other microphone. I think I might have to ask you to, uh, to say your question one more time, I'm afraid, to make sure everybody can hear that. As a remainder, uh, I still have concerns. It will mean freedom of movement will mean an increase or a lack of a decrease in the number of flights. What will the panel do to curb the number of flights taken? Flights. Flights, the number of flights taken. The uh, gentleman uh, suggests that uh, freedom of movement uh, might uh, well, keep them at their current level at, uh, I guess, at, I guess at, uh, at the best. Uh, maybe start with Catherine on that one. Yes, so uh, we have uh, a number of policies to uh, reduce aviation. Uh, we think that the um, t uh, tax breaks for aviation should be removed. Uh, and we are in favour of a frequent flyer tax. 70% uh, of the flights are taken by 15% of the people. Uh, you're right that freedom of movement might seem as if it will make people move more, but actually, on the whole, uh, it sometimes means that you end up living in the place where you needed to be to work. Uh, in, in addition, uh, it's possible to go by train. I went by train to Greece and to Italy, so we are in favour of uh, improved transport uh, that is not flying. So much of our work goes into uh, investigating the ways in which taxation currently advantages polluting kinds of transport, including cruise ships, for example, uh, and uh, Thank you very much, uh, Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I, I, I think that Catherine is right, that freedom of movement is not likely to lead to more flying. We do need to prevent the, the increase in flying. Um, the Liberal Democrats are very clear that we would not, we would stop the expansion of Heathrow and the expansion of other airports. But it doesn't mean that people shouldn't visit other countries or visit family in other places. Um, it just means that we have to do it in a sustainable and sensible way. And we do know how to get sustainable transport. It is possible. Um, people who cycle around Cambridge know that all the time. It can be very good for you. Um, but we need to make sure that people are travelling in sensible, sustainable ways and not flying. That's absolutely right. I did want to say one other thing, which was just in response to the pantomime that I have to my left, which is that actually... Um, Climate change and climate change denial is not funny. These spurious facts that we get that have been thrown at us are one of the reasons why we now have an emergency. Because we knew 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 40 years ago that this was a massive problem. If we had dealt with it in that time, we would be much better off now. We would not be facing the crisis that we are. Some so, of us have been saying so for a long time. <laughs> I know, thank you. Um, but, but actually, we have to stop accepting dubious facts which are total rubbish mm. and recognise that the science is now utterly clear mm. and we need to act fast.
is maybe over there in the, uh, in the middle. We'll take out there's also a lady in the front row here we can take uh, immediately afterwards. Uh, I'm 17 years old. What we have done on climate change so far is not enough, however impressive. If you were called on to lead a six-year national mobilisation to get this country to net zero carbon emissions by 2025, what would be your top three priorities? I want to ask the question. The, the, um, you're familiar, I'm sure, with uh, Greta Thunberg. Did you take part in any of the uh, protests uh, by um, by school children in, in Cambridge? Are you too old? Uh, I haven't taken part, but I have to say I fully support them. Okay, uh, thanks very much. Um, let, let's hear from uh, Neil Carmichael to start off with on this one. Another great question. The answer, first of all, is clean energy, making sure that all of the energy we produce is actually carbon neutral. And I think that's a really important point because we're clearly going to need cars. Second, what we're going to have to do is make sure those cars are actually not using fossil fuels of any type. We know how to set goals and make sure that they are properly in implemented. Thirdly, I think we've got to do something about waste because we waste far, far too much. Uh, I'm uh, formerly in agriculture and I well remember being absolutely dismayed at the packaging policies, uh, at the way in which food was chucked out when it was reached a certain point and where the transport and logistics systems were not up to scratch. So those are the sort of things we need to do and we need to be really tough about it. And transport too, more widely, uh, in terms of just being discussing, has to be uh, made carbon neutral. And we've got to say that, but also do it. And that's why I keep emphasising the, the importance of the role of the European Union. Do you know what? It was Ted Heath who got us into the European Union, and he, right at the start, made a speech in 1973 saying, that's what we've got to do. The trouble is, too many leaders of, uh, in, in, in political parties in this country have blamed the European Union for everything and not okay, taken you, responsibility themselves. Firstly, you know, definitely more sustainable energy. Um, no matter what the Tory party can say, you know, the accords have to use solar panel, we might restore it. Secondly, we need to make sure that our homes are more uh, eco friendly. Um, so much energy is wasted um, due to, uh, because our areas we waste so much energy on our own houses. And lastly, also, green transport strategy. Green transport strategy. We are quite good in Cambridge, we started over there, um, but, you know, our transport needs to be across all these two different parts, frankly, quite terrible. Uh, we need to do more so that we can actually use uh, trains to get from places to Ipswich, not sitting going to London all the time. Um, so there's a few things I'm trying to do. Yeah, thank you, Alvin. Um, okay, so the lady in the, in the front here, uh, right in the front row, if we could uh, get the microphone across to her, very close to Anthony's camp as well. Mm -hmm. I hope this is connected. I think it is. I'm interested in the effect of 5G. And the research that's being done suggests that it's very, very damaging to health. And I'm very concerned about that for my children and grandchildren. And all I hear from public uh, publications, sorry, um, is that it's safe, it's going to be wonderful, and it's going to make all our internet connections faster and so on. Do we actually need that at the expense of our health? I kind of like it to be possible to make a phone call on the train between Cambridge and King's Cross, but that's another, that's another story I suspect altogether. Uh, Edmund, maybe you have a view on this. 5G? Not your idea. 5G. <laughs> um, I, I don't know about the um, health issues. I have not looked into the matter, so I'm not going to answer you. Um, the, I have heard, of course, that it does depend on line of sight communications and uh, the uh, trial of the technology we call people chopping down lots of trees in order to make sure that they get their line of sight communications, which doesn't seem to be totally environmentally friendly. Um, um, does that really answer your question? No. I haven't studied the matter on the health things and I have not, I have not um, researched well, it. So well, uh, we'll, we'll give you Edmund if, you if, you're, if you're not familiar with, uh, with, with the topic. Um, maybe uh, Tom, get off of you. 
This could be the, this could be the question from hell, I'm afraid, for, for all of our I'm afraid, I'm afraid I've done uh, no more research on the matter than anyone has. Um, amusingly, um, I do have um, an anecdote to tell, which is um, I was having lunch with my fellow uh, Conservative candidates uh, the other day. But Jeffrey uh, Van Orden was asking, who's uh, number one on our list, was asking the same question because his daughter is extremely concerned on the same basis and has a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, queries for him. And was asking if uh, our number seven on the list, uh, Waz Magal, who is, it turns out, a telecoms engineer. His answer was, uh, there's a lot of news, it'll all be fine. Now, I'm not a technical specialist, but when somebody who works in the field tells me that, I have to take him at face value. Nonetheless, as a general point of principle, it's extremely important that any new technology that comes through has extremely rigorous testing. I know there was a number of concerns around mobile telephony uh, when it first came out, about the impact that it had. Those turned out to be ungrounded. I'm certainly hopeful that it's the same about uh, 5G, but I hope that the government and uh, the relevant authorities are putting the, the work and uh, the experimentation into finding out exactly what's going on and, and what the impacts will be. Do you want to, uh, to, 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 uh, to, to come in on that one? Well, I, I, actually have to answer, I actually can answer this question. Okay, Apparently, good. the campaign with my constituency, which was obsessed with the idea of uh, mobile phones doing damage, actually they don't. Um, nor do the uh, um, various radar systems that are used. What we should instead be talking about is the amazing impact they have on improving society, improving the economy. And let's think of Africa, for example. They don't even bother with landlines now. They've gone straight into mobile. And what a fabulously empowering thing that has been for the people of Africa. And it really reminds me of an essential point here. Technology can be our friend. It can work in our favour and it's connected too to the issues we were talking about before. We've got to understand technology is there. We've got to be clear about how we use it. And for Europe, it's a great opportunity uh, to demonstrate how we can affect uh, politics and the economy of the world. Thank you very much, uh, Neil. Uh, I hope that went uh, a little bit towards answering your question. I'm tempted to say, being, being Cambridge, there may very well be somebody in the audience with a, uh, with a degree in the topic. But we have to move on, I'm afraid. Um, and we're going to ask, ask about migration and uh, freedom of movement. Over the uh, last two years, the EU countries have uh, granted protection to more than 800,000 asylum seekers and we settled refugees. So Cambridge has offered places to 100 Syrian refugees. Would you welcome more? Uh, tell her. I'm an immigrant and I'm for things all kinds. Thank you very much, Patricia, and that uh, takes us to Alvin. Um, you may be able to ask a question, but uh, it's not quite for anyone to know that I'm the table through the movement. Um, my family, for my family, I'm from second generation from Cox, so therefore I come, I come to the UK from Commonwealth because of the opportunities that I was given, my family came from the UK. Um, why should we deny this? Those, um, benefits to the people of the whole EU. There are so many people who come to this country and enrich the lives of so many people in this country. I have a brother in law to fetch, I don't have nieces, my family is the I found in the Netherlands. Okay. We are we gain so much more uh, for being part of the community of countries than we are from being from experience as well. I think that immigration is um, the, the, the value that immigrants bring and the talents that they bring are of huge benefit to this country. Um, my father-in-law came here from Sri Lanka, uh, I think anyone for 50 years ago now. He's an amazingly talented musician, he's brought amazing gifts to this country as have many other immigrants. I think we need to disentangle some of these issues, so I think the issue of immigration, the issue of freedom of movement and the issue of refugees are all separate and we need to make sure we know as such. Um, I am ashamed of how many refugees this country takes. We should be taking far, far more than we are. Cambridge has done 
better than many places, but the whole country is, is not taking its um, fair share. Um, my brother-in-law is from Greece. That country is um, having to take far, far more um, immigrants from um, south of the Mediterranean. Um, and it should be a it should be a burden which is much more fairly shared across the EU and having not got the answer, been able to answer the question about um, how we would reform the EU, that's one of the things that needs reforming, it certainly is. Um, but that is also a different issue from the issue of freedom of movement and the issue of freedom of movement is just as much about the rights of people in this country to go and work and live abroad as it is for the EU. Yes, I agree uh, with the way the previous speaker split this up. Uh, as far as immigration goes, we are a crowded country and I think we should be able to control our immigration policy. Many other countries in the world do the same. They're not vicious, vile, racist bigots. They just want to control who comes into their country. That is not unreasonable. As regards uh, re refugees, I feel that our foreign aid budget will be much better spent in building really good refugee camps near these areas of conflict because wars always finish. And it is far better if you can settle people in the, the climate they're used to, if you can get them involved in helping build a refugee camp, it's much better there than transporting them thousands of miles into countries where, which they're not familiar with and where often tensions can, can result. Because I'm in the, uh, the ENF group in the Parliament, I do hear about the dark side of this, which nobody ever likes to talk about. So, rather than lining the pockets of wealthy dictators with the money we take from our taxpayers as foreign aid, build good refugee camps and wait for the law to finish. Thank you. Thank you, Stuart. And to Edmund now for Brexit Party. Okay, thank you. Um, I didn't expect to be agreeing too much with Lucy Ettinger, but I do think she's made a very um, uh, important contribution, which is to be clear thinking and distinguish between separate issues uh, of immigration, of freedom of movement, and of refugees. Um, there's no doubt that the issue of freedom of movement was a very live uh, issue in the, uh, in the referendum uh, that we had in 2016, and that, of course, we do stand for um, control of our own borders because until you've got that, you simply cannot have a policy for uh, immigration or for refugees. Thank you very much. Uh, Stuart uh, Neil for Change UK. Well, I like to think of myself as a Viking because I was born in Northumberland. And I'm not saying that because they were immigrants, they just attacked us. But the fact of the matter is, we're all, we're all related uh, to people who have come. Yeah. And we will be remembered for that. Uh, for example, the Asian Ugandans who came here in the 1970s, they are making a massive contribution to our economy now. And we should celebrate that. And we did when we were in the House of Commons after the 40th uh, anniversary. We do know, the, however, that we've got to be sensible about what we're talking about here. So let's get a few facts out. Fact number one. No more people have ever come from the European Union than from the rest of the world into this country. And any single year. Not one year. So we're actually talking about the wrong thing. We are thinking, hammer up freedom of movement. That will solve our immigration problem. Because it won't. Our immigration problem is an issue for us to decide because we're in charge of it. And we need to take responsibility for it. And if I was taking responsibility for it, I'd be far more generous to the people who really need to come here. And I'd be far more accepting of the people who actually need to have here as a country, as a free place, as a place which relies on good people coming here. So that's my approach to immigration. And it's really important we stop this language which is inappropriate now about talking about other people and why they're here, how they've got here and all of the rest. We are in this country a place where individuals matter and whatever individual you happen to be, you should be here. Thank you very much. I should probably declare an interest here. Um, my wife is a first generation immigrant in this country. She came from Asia. Um, I have uh, two mixed heritage children and another one on the way. I'm very pleased to say. Um, so I have a, a vested interest in uh, the way that immigration is managed in this country. I think the question, however, was on refugees. If we went now to a camp in Syria and asked the people, what do you want? Most likely they would respond, 
I want to go home. I want the wars to stop, and I want to go home. That's what we should be helping to make happen. Of course, our, our doors should be open to people who are in need, people who really do uh, rely on us, and we should have a, a managed immigration system which allows people who want to come here and work and best themselves to come into the country and, and have that opportunity. But most of all, you know, in our dealings with difficult regimes, with water, uh, water on situations, we need to be looking at what is best for those people, what actually do they want, and if the answer to that is they just want to go home, we should be helping to make that happen. Thank you very much, uh, Tom. And uh, to Catherine uh, from Bridge. As with almost all the things that get people wound up, we need to be looking at what are our, our responsibilities. We have a proud heritage of welcoming refugees and strangers in times of need. But sometimes the times of need are created by other people, and sometimes the times of need are created by ourselves. Sometimes we are selling arms to the countries that are destroying the lives. So when that's happening, and the refugees are knocking on our door because they cannot live where they're where they were coming from, then it's our responsibility not just to take in the refugees and make them welcome and provide for them, it's our responsibility to look at what we're doing. And the same applies to climate change. It's the parts of the world that are most vulnerable, the parts where there are droughts and shortages, these are caused by the Western lifestyle which is exhausting the planet's resources. We are putting all our efforts into growth in GDP, measuring our success by that, and then wondering why the rest of the world is begging to come in. It's a complete upside down economy, and that's what we need to do when we want a six year reformation of uh, the whole way the world works. We need to start measuring success, not by uh, GDP, but by something else. questions there on the subject of migration or freedom of movement. As always, put your uh, hand up. I see a few hands. There is a lady, I think, in, I'm making it the fifth row, over there on this on this side. Keep your hand up. You've got some green in your hair, I think. Do you have a That's you. Yes, 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 yes. <laughs> um, do you accept the breaking point cities in a referendum by Nigel Farge and UKIP was fundamentally racist? Question. And then to uh, across the other side of the table. Um, well, it, it depicted people of different races in it, didn't it? As far as I recall. Yes. If it had just been one race in entirety, you might say, well, it's racist. But if it shows <laughs> different, different people. Personally, I just thought it reflected the truth. But a lot of people simply don't want to hear the truth. We are. We, we have received an enormous number of migrants since 2005, since the AA countries joined. And that, I know, has caused problems. And it was all very well for people to shake their heads and say, come on, it's wonderful, it's wonderful, it's wonderful. If three million people arrive in this country in a fairly short period of time, it does put a huge stress on local resources. It puts stress on housing, it puts stress on education, where you have young people in school. Not as much austerity. Is that you? Can call it. <laughs> <laughs> That's not, thank you. <laughs> I think what I recall. No, good up, thank you. Sorry, I'll just cut you off there, Edmund, uh, to you, and then we'll hear from that one. Edmund. Well, I'm not quite sure what, what's uh, really behind this question. Um, it may be entirely overt. They've stuck me in front of the uh, you know, <laughs> flag, which is what you started, and they did try to object to that. I, I think so, we're all in um, front of one, actually, somebody, as well. I think it's somebody, a, a, a consequence of where we are. Somebody being photographed in front of a poster doesn't tell you anything at all, really, about what their views are. And if the attempt is to cast um, the Brexit party in particular as being a racist party, I think that that is a baseless slander, uh, which I would be um, really rather objecting to. I would, not do, I would not have anything to do with a party that I thought was in any 
any sense racist, and I think if you look at the lineup of the candidates that we've got in the Brexit party, um, our number two candidate who was uh, unveiled on meeting was Ben Habib, who is part of Pakistani. He's already had to have a Twitter exchange with Chakramuna, who accused us of uh, racialism. He said, I think that uh, you've got the room under the stick. Um, Mr. Muna, can we meet and discuss your prejudices? Go look it up on Twitter. We've had Al Qasibul Cuthbert, who was our number four and veiled our launch meeting. She's a second generation uh, uh, Indian from an uh, Indian immigrant family. We've got Elizabeth Babadi, who's Nigerian. We've got Christina Jordan, who's Malaysian. Uh, we've even got Thank Thank you, Norman, and his good shot. He's had to put up with a 30-foot swastika painted on the door of his business premises because he happens to be Jewish. If anything, um, it's the candidates of the Brexit Party who have been victims of racial <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Albert, please. If there wasn't a racist picture, then what might have been to show that French citizen is trying to get this country, or Spanish citizen is trying to get this country? <laughs> It was a very specific image. It wasn't the only image of people on the ETU, it was the image of the Syrian on the Turkey. It was the And it was part of the campaign scale on the best end, and it was people coming from the Middle East and Turkey into this country. It will be, we're repeatedly told, Turkey is not going to enter the EU, because it's fear that all these strange people out there who don't look at this country. It's pandering, it's racist, and it's fear mongering. I just want to answer this slightly more generally. Um, I think the immigration issue was wound up enormously before yeah. the referendum vote. Um, and I think it's one of the reasons why that vote is so unreliable. I think in the intervening uh, three years, many, many people have come to understand that this country relies on immigrants. We cannot get enough nurses to, the, to look after people in Addenbrooke's hospital. We cannot get enough people to look after elderly people in their homes. We have a really serious skills and um, employment crisis in this country, partly because so many European people are choosing not to come and live here anymore because they don't feel welcome. And that booster was a lot to do with it, and we need to change that. Otherwise, people are not going to be able to retire because we're all going to have to work till we're 75. <laughs> Hi, I'm Alexandra and I work for the 3 million. Two of the groups most affected at the moment by Brexit are the 3 million EU citizens in the UK and British people living in other EU countries. Mm -hmm. uh, I recently had to apply for settled status to continue living in my own home in the UK and my British friends in Romania don't even know what their status will be after Brexit if Brexit happens. Mm -hmm. So whatever the Brexit outcome, whatever kind of deal we have or no deal or whatever, it's really crucial now that we ensure those rights are protected. And don't, please don't tell me it's all done and dusted unless you actually read the legislation and unless you actually know how secondary legislation can be changed on citizens' rights. People, those people can vote, I'll vote in the UK, I choose to vote in the UK for the EU elections and I won't vote for anyone who doesn't support 100% citizens' rights, British in Europe and EU citizens in the UK. So I would like to ask you, what would you do if elected? to put pressure on the EU as well, because it's both a UK and the EU issue, to make sure that regardless of, uh, of the deal or no deal, those rights are protected and separated from the other negotiations, because we're speaking about people's lives, uh, and it's, it would should be ended up in a situation that people have less fewer rights than some products going across borders. Uh, we have the three million pledge. I pledge okay, to protect citizens' rights, so if you want to sign it at the end, please let me know. Thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I'm fully supportive of that pledge. I'll, I'll certainly sign that afterwards. Thank you. Uh, it's um, extremely important. It's a very, very clear uh, policy from the Conservative Party that the, uh, the rights of um, EU citizens who are in the UK at the moment will be maintained post Brexit. Obviously, there has to be a process by which those people are, are recognised as being settled within the UK. I, I work with a number of EU citizens who have applied for this and they told me it took about 15 minutes on the phone. Um, it's, it's also a problem. It took me two hours. I had to provide evidence for every single year in the UK and I'm a PhD student, so it's not easy for everyone, I have to admit that. Um, I, I can appreciate that, this, this, um, that there are different circumstances for different people. Um, 
notwithstanding, it, it is within uh, our control to be able to make that offer to EU citizens. And I think one of the biggest mistakes that uh, we made as a party was not to make that clear from the outset. That should have been the first thing that the Conservative Party made on day one. If you're in this country, you will have the right to remain in this country and full citizen, uh, a pathway to full citizenship rights post-Brexit. Um, as an individual, I, I totally support the work that our party and our uh, government is doing to put pressure on other EU countries to extend the same rights. Obviously, that's not within our control. However, I fully hope and expect that all EU countries will extend the same rights to the uh, British citizens who choose to remain in the EU. Okay, thank you, Tom. Uh, Attila. If this process that was not being by me to go through here, um, I would not like to be a uh, second class citizen here. Mm. Um, so, uh, I'm living here in the last decade. He's been born here. Uh, and I'm standing here as a cross border candidate, being a citizen of a very European country, really enjoying the practice of the Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I've got one more question on uh, this particular topic. There's a lady in the front row there who's just so keen. Uh, <laughs> and we'll hear from her next. Um, Thank I you. I'd like to ask uh, the panel about current EU's sort of position around uh, refugee camps. So they've already agreed to spend 38 billion euros on camps primarily keeping out Africans and uh, people from the Middle East. I want to understand how you might uh, change that or how you're going to supplement that. I'm really concerned that they're a coercive way of keeping a lot of black people out of Europe. Uh, I am a second generation uh, mixed race uh, person that's come into this country. Interestingly enough, I'm one in three the uh, BMEs uh, in Great Britain that voted for Brexit. This is a debate of conundrum people haven't really faced. So there's two things to my question. One, understanding the amount of obscene amount of money that, that uh, we agreed to in terms of the EU as it stands, uh, prohibiting those black people coming through. And two, how do you square that with what's actually happened with the Brexit vote? Thank you. Um, Neil first, Neil Carmichael for Change UK. I want to respond to first up your question. I'm here because I want to stop Brexit and I think that's the answer ultimately to the point that you made. I think the other interesting angle it was, is this. We are having this discussion because we're in a weaker position precisely because we are thinking of leaving and when we do leave we'll be in a weaker position still. And I think that's wrong. And I think that we need to reverse it because I think the point and of the way is the latest question from, from, from just now. Uh, your question, where have we gone? Uh, and your question back. Is, is equally uh, important. But the real issue here is that what we've got to do as a European Union is make sure that the countries around Europe are flourishing as well. Because the whole problem we've actually got, if we've got a a total imbalance between continents in terms of economic power and, and opportunities. And so that would be the way I would uh, operate. I but do not like the idea of camps. <laughs> I think that's in totally uh, at variance with our interests as a, as, a, as a liberal democracy. And I think we've got to find a way of stopping that happening. And I think we've got to have a, a holistic policy for the European Union which actually treats people much more carefully, much more considerately in terms of, of where they go if they do come here. But Neil, uh, I if I could ask um, a follow-up, if, if I may, the lady referred to, uh, as she sees it, people who are coming to, into Europe from, from Africa. Are you, are you saying, I know there are, are rules which suggest that uh, migrants or uh, would, would stop the first European country they, uh, they get to, that would put a whole lot of pressure on a whole lot of countries, whilst the others at the other side would be able to absent themselves some responsibility. I've long wondered why the European Union doesn't have a, a, a border strategy for the whole of the European Union, because I think that's the answer. But I repeat the point I've already made. It is, respond, it is our approach, which I think is helpful here, in, in connection with what happens in Africa. I think that's what we've got to think about. That's how, if you're going to focus on Africa, but I could, no, it could be anywhere. I just uh, uh, mentioned, uh, I mentioned it as well. We want good governance and sensible economic policies and good opportunities. 
I, I took, um, it's a long story, so I won't have time to tell you the whole thing, but I took um, a party of parliamentarians from Myanmar to South Africa, because I wanted the, an exchange of information on how they could improve education, how they could improve uh, the, their economies. And we're getting there. And it's that kind of approach, that kind of policy, that will really make lasting and long-term differences. And I repeat, okay, it is about the European Union. Okay, thank you for being here. It's fine, it's not enough time. Thank you anyway. Uh, can we please ask uh, Catherine, please? Uh, yes, so um, this goes uh, back to the, uh, the same issue about uh, support for the other countries. There's a naive assumption that sending foreign aid uh, is something that we should be doing because it's more important to keep the money at home. But it's very important um, uh, uh, to uh, support the countries from which these people are coming. But um, more importantly, we are working on getting increased financial support within the EU uh, for integrating refugees. So we're in favour of uh, collaborative efforts to uh, rehome uh, refugees uh, across Europe, not have them uh, confined in camps in the south of Europe, which is already overstretched because of the austerity rules which have been so damaging to Greece and Italy. Uh, and we are also planning to introduce humanitarian visas uh, as a system for uh, um, helping with this kind of issue. But as I say, ultimately the problem is why the wars are there and why the refugees are finding it impossible to stay at home. Because most people would like to stay where they belong, if, if, where their home is, where their families are, if they are not driven out by war, famine, and uh, the impossibility of maintaining their lives there. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Captain. <laughs> Let's uh, turn our attention now to the economy, and the European economy is apparently forecast to continue expanding at what's described as the seventh year in a row in 2019. But how does the European economic policy deal with both the US and with China. Let's uh, ask maybe a pillar to start on uh, this one. How, how does the European economic <laughs> policy deal with both the US and China? I'm here to represent the single issue. It's not really being represented that much. Sorry, you can Okay. And then, in which case, to Alvin. Move along to you. Uh, stay with. No, no, not one. <laughs> All right, there we go. Sorry. Right. Right. Uh, so when we use so we're part of the largest trading bloc in the entire world, uh, we achieve more when we work together than actually. We have we in a strong negotiating position by working with most other countries to actually just negotiate on our own. This idea that somehow we need a better negotiating position on our own with the SP or states has been across the way. You told your partner. <laughs> uh, maybe you can tell you about uh, So, uh, what I was about, in terms of the economy, I mean, the reason I'm standing in Canada is basically the, the, the European part of the European session is a very part of the world's key force that could work as well. So, it's not just the economy, but how we benefit from this incredible growth of the economy in Europe. Okay? So, it's, it's also making sure that we uh, tax multinational companies and that they actually contribute their fair share to the European economy to deal with the one issue such as you know, climate change. It's also shown that we can follow up this rights and make sure that there's a minimum wage across all the entire towers of Europe. It's about making sure that you know, everyone gets to <coughs> everyone gets to uh, share in the process of the in the European Union. Okay, thank you, Robert. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, so I think that the, the changes in the world economy that have happened in the last um, year or two are pretty substantial for all of us and, and really quite serious. Um, and, and they are another really major reason why it is so important that we remain part of the European Union. This is not a time for this country to go off and start trying to set up on its own. Um, there, the, the conflict between the US and China, or the potential conflict, is really quite worrying for all of us. And we need, as a European Union, to stick together. I think the European Union has actually got a really good record um, on challenging multinational companies. They, um, the European Union is 
pretty much the only organisation which has been willing to take on the likes of Google um, to challenge some of their monopolistic tendencies. Uh, and I think we really need to keep doing that and to keep standing up for a rules-based, law-based economic system, which is actually in the, in the end in the interest of all countries, but is not being supported by the other major blocs at the moment. So having the EU there standing up for a legal system where, where everybody can take part is really critical and we must remain part of the European Union and take our place in backing a system where everybody knows what the law is and abides by it because that is not what's happening at the moment. Neither China nor the US have a formal trading agreement with the European Union, yet both over the years have sold increasing numbers of, of items, of products, and that proves that you do not have to be in political union with other countries in order to sell them your wares. <laughs> and that is demonstrated by these two countries. There is, however, some gross hypocrisy that goes on. As farmers, we are being, our hands are being tied behind our backs in the way that we can produce our crops. And this goes on in the Agri Committee, in the Envy Committee, all the time. You can't use this, you can't use that. Meanwhile, the European Union happily imports meat and soybeans produced in other countries, produced by methods that we are not allowed to use, and they circulate in the European Union as though there is nothing wrong at all. I think this hypocrisy has to be addressed. We cannot farm with one hand tied behind our backs whilst we compete with people who've got a sword in each hand. Thank you very much, uh, Stuart. Uh, Brexit party efforts, please. <laughs> Not quite sure I understand the question, but of course the Brexit party stands for the independence of the United Kingdom and the freedom <laughs> to strike our own uh, free trade agreements with uh, anybody we please, including the United States and including China. Uh, including the European Union, uh, if they were so interested. Um, so um, that's the position of the Brexit Party. Okay, thank you, uh, Edmund, which uh, takes us uh, then across to Change UK and Neil, Neil from Michael. Right, let's do a bit of fact checking here. First of all, uh, Germany exports four times as much to China as we do. Is that anything to do with their benefit of the European Union or our benefit of the European Union? No, it's actually their productivity level. <laughs> so what we've got to do is sharpen up our own performance, and that's one of the messages Change UK has. The second fact check is, it's not really about tariffs, it's about barriers. That's what everybody understands if they really know anything about trade. It's about barriers, not tariffs. And this argument going on between China and, and the United States is the wrong argument to be having, and they'll both discover that. What we in the European Union need to do is emphasise the importance of a rules-based structure, as Lucy has pointed out, but also emphasise the, the power uh, of the single market, because that's where you deal with the barriers. If anyone ever saw a Triumph TR7, a fabulous car in my view, but they got nowhere in the United States because there was a rule introduced something to do with a petrol tank. That's a barrier. And that's what destroyed the TR7's uh, hopes and aspirations in the United States. So we've got to really understand that it's actually about that that matters. So why should we stay in the European Union? Precisely because we've got the leverage and the power to influence those things. If you want to trade, this is the place to do it within the European Union. Now I'm going to choose two final facts. We actually export a uh, staggering amount uh, to uh, India, but we sell the same amount to the Netherlands. And the Netherlands is a good deal smaller than India, and the same ratio applies to China and to Germany. So we are, quite frankly, barking you, up the wrong tree if we decide the best thing to do is leave the European Union. I always want to ask more about that. Let's uh, move to uh, Tom McLaren from the Conservatives instead. Thank you very much. Do you mind just repeating the question? Yes, yeah, sure. The, uh, the question was that uh, in the European Union, or indeed out of it, how do we deal with both the trade policies of the United States and of China? 
Well, I think that's an important clarification on uh, the question, in fact, because the, the question should be, uh, what should the UK do? Because the Conservative Party policy is to take us out of the European Union. So what the European Union chooses to do about China and uh, the United States will be an interested bystander. We'll have a, you know, some kind of uh, uh, stake in the game in terms of uh, our cooperation with the European Union with a new trade agreement that will be negotiated going forwards. However, it will be for the European Union to negotiate that, not for the United Kingdom. It will be the has, uh, has Dr. Fox, Dr. Neil Fox, who's uh, negotiating <laughs> deals with people, has he managed to add uh, the United States or, or China to the <laughs> 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 It's Liam Fox. Sorry, Liam Fox. Um, Liam Fox has been working extremely hard on this. <laughs> <laughs> sign in a new trade agreements while we remain a member of the EU because that would actually be illegal in EU law. I mean, the, the fundamental premise of your question I, I fully accept, which is that there are opportunities and threats in the world. The world is changing um, from a business and from an economic perspective in a way that it possibly last changed uh, during the Victorian period. We're seeing the growth of China as an international force and um, that in itself, both in terms of uh, flexing its business muscle but also flexing its military muscle and we as a country have to choose how we respond to that. I've always been in favour of engagement. I'm fully uh, aware of the challenges that we uh, face in dealing with an autocratic regime like China. However, it is very important that we work extremely closely both with our American partners but also with uh, new and uh, developing relationships in China and the developing world to create the best trade environment and open up the opportunities that that will bring for the United Kingdom. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tom. And uh, finally, this section uh, three, uh, Catherine Grove, please. Yes, yeah, so the question started with uh, a point about growth, and uh, the suggestion seems to be, and it's been dominant in our politics recently uh, for some years, that uh, you measure the success uh, of an operation, a country, a trade deal, or a uh, whatever it is that you're measuring by whether it leads to a growth in GDP. Uh, and this uh, is uh, not actually the way that the European Union uh, was set up or should be operating, partly because of the climate change issue. There's an issue about whether pursuit of unbridled growth is uh, sustainable in any case. But also, one of the points of the uh, European Union was that we would ne not necessarily pursue profit at all costs, but that we would agree about workers' rights and about uh, provision for environmental protections and that kind of thing. So as a group we agree on things that are not going to be competitively ad advantageous but are beneficial on another standard of uh, measure of what is a good and prosperous society. One in which people can have weekends and go on holiday. And, and for that reason, uh, we are building into all future EU trade deals, uh, because the Greens are in favour of this and because we are going to promote it, I think maybe we've already uh, achieved it, I'm not sure, uh, that uh, workers' rights and environmental standards will be built into all new trade agreements. Because it's absolutely vital that we stop counting growth and start counting environmental protection as the measure of what we're actually achieving that we can be proud of. on the economy or finance if we want to. We should probably allow Paul as uh, from Cambridge Stage, who's uh, one of the organisers here uh, tonight to take the first question on this. Oh, I'll have a question. But first, actually, a point of order. I think I heard a quote just earlier uh, from another audience member about 38 billion being spent on refugee camps by the EU. I have no idea where that figure came from. We couldn't find it anywhere. I think it's utter nonsense, probably. But I, I'd like to be disproved. Or, or, but it's, it seems very, very unlikely to me. And an example of the kind of fake news that we're used to dealing with in this process. <laughs> um, my question is actually, what is, is it about the, the EU that makes so many of the worst examples of vulture capitalism and climate change denying industries and companies which want to ensure that they can minimise their tax um, uh, payments by offshoring them here and there and moving them around so that they don't actually have to declare them in any particular country. Um, what makes them so keen to undermine the EU? 
I, quite, I just want to say something about Ireland, if you don't mind. I mean, I agree. Uh, I don't think the question was yeah. oh, well, Ireland. Ireland. With Ireland. <laughs> Ireland has a corporation tax okay. rate which is very low. The European Commission do not like that because it, they think, feel it's giving Ireland an unfair advantage. Ireland is attracting investment and companies setting up there. So the EU is starting to wave a big stick at Ireland and saying, Oi. If you don't raise your corporation tax rates, you might find us making life difficult you vis-a-vis -vis Brexit. And that is going on at the moment. Yeah, that's why 85% of people in Ireland support being in the EU. <laughs> I saw uh, Neil itching to uh, answer this one. So, uh, Neil, would you like to, uh, to, to have, a, have a look at this? I think it's a really good question. I think that one of the next phases of the European Union has to be uh, uh, more uh, attention to the, the movement of capital, the movement of avoidance of tax. I think that's the way we can really help here. I think the European Union has a real power there if it wants to use it. I think the problem is, and it's sort of alluded to, that everybody kind of blames the European Union uh, without actually recognising that it doesn't always have the capacity and power because the politicians in charge of the domestic states don't actually give it those powers. But this gives me an opportunity just to correct something which I heard before, which the European Union has not reformed. And I'm just going to tell you three things where it really has reformed. One, agriculture. Twenty odd years ago, you had headed payments, so wine lens, butter mountains. Today, CAP is completely devoted towards uh, protecting the environment. That's a reform. Two, the introduction of the single market. That has to be one of the biggest reforms ever implemented, and it involves changing of decision-making structures across Europe and delivered a free, uh, fair uh, economy. And three, and this is the thing I find so surprising t tonight, is we've got one member of the European Parliament who does not appear to realise that it was created during the lifetime of the European Union, and also its powers were extended and also it became elected. Now they are reforms. And just remember this, the European Union can actually eject the entire Commission, which it has done so once already with spectacular success. So that is a powerful reform which we should be noting and which we should be deploying. Thank you. Thank you. I, I also think it's a really interesting question and um, for me the question was why are so many uh, venture capitalists, big monopolistic country, uh, companies, so against the EU? And I think part of the question, uh, part of the answer is that actually um, when you've got quite a dispersed power structure and lots and lots of countries, it's quite difficult to, for, for, um, for big business and big money to have the same kind of influence on political structures that it does in, other, in this country and in many individual countries. There are a huge number of people that you have to try and take out for dinner, um, wine and dine, all that kind of stuff. I, I have been, since becoming the leader of the County Council, I have been appalled at the, at the influence of money in British politics. Um, I grew up naively thinking that we had a relatively uncorrupt political system, and my goodness, I've grown up. Um, it is not uncorrupt, and the influence of big money on our political system is pretty horrendous. I think when you're trying to deal with such a large number of countries, with lots and lots of governments and lots and lots of ministers, it's much harder to do that slightly corrupting influence. And while there are many, many things we may criticise the European Union for, I do think that actually it is a very rules-based system, and while we don't always succeed in maintaining those rules, it is much harder for um, big companies and venture capitalists to actually get down and write the rules. Um, so I think that's one of the answers, and I think it's something that we should be profoundly grateful for for the EU. Respect disputes in the panel. We might have one within the audience. Now, Paul mentioned a fact he disagreed with the lady before. The lady before, um, who I should ask your name, Adam. Cyrus. Cyrus. So, the fact that you're challenging, I guess, Paul's yeah. uh, answer to your facts, just, sure, to, just sure. for the record, quickly. Uh, yeah, uh, I think democratic debate uh, falls down when people start throwing fake news at people when they make a contribution. So, my source 
is The Independent. The title of, of uh, the article is The EU Plans to Triple Spending on Border Controls in Response to... Uh, bear with me. <laughs> uh, 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 money will be spent in response to the refugee crisis. And the uh, article's by John Stone, Wednesday the 13th of June 2018. And, I'm assuming he's a Brussels correspondent. Oh, well, I can say. Did I mention 38 minutes? Yeah, billion, which includes the reserve, yeah. So yeah. just look it up. Uh, million and I'm billion. happy to email it in your billion. <laughs> okay. billion. Uh, I urge people to have a look at that, and maybe as a, as a good journalist, I would recommend they check the second or third source. Um, <laughs> can we take the gentleman there in the fourth <laughs> row? Put the microphone to him, please. There we go. Thanks, sir. Yeah, uh, thanks, Sarah, for that. I, I wasn't going to dispute the figures, but I don't know, you probably joined Spike or whatever, and, and weirdly supporting the uh, Brexit party, but we won't go into that right now. <laughs> anyway, um, I was going to mention, uh, uh, the, like, both China and EU, support, well, I think they're both uh, China and EU are supporting us of the US, because we live in an international capitalist system. So I, I think that's why we have a global hierarchy of states. But I think the, the alternative is that a strong working class in the EU and a radical socialist United Europe would inspire the US working class and international working class, and, and that would be better able to challenge US uh, hegemonic power. Have you, got a, have you got a specific it's, question? It's a strategy. Uh, no, 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 yeah, of course. And it's a, it's a strategy. I think all well, these things are complicated, and Sarah's right to say that these are, these should be more debates. I mean, no, I disagree with Sarah on things, but she, she's correct. I mean, there should be more debates. Yeah, What's your question? <laughs> this is more complicated. I think it's a strategy, and I just want to ask all the candidates what they think about that strategy, because at the moment, I, I will vote critically Labour because I think we need a stronger left, uh, but strategically, it needs to be needs to be stronger. And so, just the, so the, the strategy in which direction, which particular? Well, the left, a stronger left. Yeah. And, you know, I'm the Labour Party. We have disagreements in the Labour Party all the time, and that's healthy, and that's how it should be. Okay, thanks. Um, then, uh, can I ask you for maybe uh, a brief comment on that? If the Labour Party is winning its mouth on your hand, actually, it's not a new position as long as possible, and if you're in the Labour Party, I'm aware that we have decades of history. So this thing about what the child is changing about the working people. There will be a definite change if the left is well in the history of the new elections. And as I said, we have quite a lot of manifesto about the initiatives and manifesto. We have quite a deal about expanding the world's rights and all these other issues. So yes, uh, I am a democratic socialist. I believe that we can achieve changes for the left uh, in a democratic way. And, um, and despite what I've said, I think that the EU is a democratic organisation that will enable us to do that. Thank you, David. Uh, thank you, David. I've got a map here of where everybody is. So you would sit, uh, presumably, with the socialists and, uh, and democrats. Yes. Uh, well, I suspect yes. if our friend over here was elected, he might go for the, for the left group, which is uh, a, a, separate, a separate section. <laughs> Okay, right. Uh, let's see if there's a couple more questions. There's a, a gentleman right over that side, if we can uh, get a microphone to him. And... Well, I was trying to still talk about the economy. Yeah, we need to wait for the microphone to come across. And then there's a lady sitting over here who we can take up. Thank you, you sir. I've got a quick question at the end, but I'd like to come back on uh, Neil about um, the, uh, the economics in the EU. Because um, one thing that's been rarely discussed in this country is the EMU and the distorting impact of the EMU on the whole of the economy of Europe. Yes, Germany did very well out of it because effectively its currency was devalued, so it was able to increase exports, etc., etc., and improve its productivity. The flip side of it was the countries of southern Europe, particularly ended up being Greece and to a lesser extent Italy, um, who were in a position where they could actually borrow more because they were in the EU. But overborrowed and suffered, and that's actually ended up in quite severe austerity, austerity far worse than here, including actually you know mortality rates going up and etc. and stuff like like that. But my my point is, a people need to be aware of the effect of the EU historically and economically. It's an important thing. It's not just a straight. It's a great thing to be in. 
but my main point, I guess, that comes out of that would, would be, would the panel, uh, what is their policy on, say, during, joining the Euro? Do they have long-term aim to join the Euro or not? Okay, I'll, um, thank you very much. So I'll start with Neil on that question. Dave, you're going to ask the first point of then, and then move on to the gentleman's more general question. If I had a pound for everybody who told me that the, the euro uh, was going to collapse any time soon, I think I would uh, be really a very rich person and be able to buy up the euro. Uh, it is not going to collapse. It is going to remain uh, a, a currency. We are uh, not in it and we have the opt-out of it. The first point is if we leave the European Union then try to join, uh, we'll end up being part of the uh, single euro, single uh, currency by default. That's not an ideal situation for us. Uh, this, the point uh, we've always got to understand is how bad was the situation before the euro started. That's when debt was piling up. That's when devaluation was used, competitive devaluation. That is not a good way of running an economy. The best idea is to have a hard currency so that you actually do get the structural reforms that are necessary to bring about results which are satisfactory or better. And in Spain and in Greece, that has happened. If you look at those two economies, you can see the economy in Greece has actually started to uh, implement those structural reforms. And in Spain, the situation is much better still. And that is good news. It's not good news that we've still got a lot of youth unemployment in those countries and in some others. But it is good news that the Spanish economy has really thrived. Remember actually where Spain came from. General Franco died in 1975. He was handing out free beer to keep the people happy and there was actually starvation in parts of Spain as early as the 1980s. Now, that does not happen now at all in Spain. It's a terrific achievement that that has uh, been the consequence uh, of, the, of the European Union and of the Euro. If you look at Poland, Think of what Poland was in the 1980s. Spain was good, and, and Poland would have been too. Um, <laughs> can I ask uh, you to, uh, to, to pick up one of these please? Oh, can I where we left off? Because I think that was an excellent um, direction of travel. I think that the, the point that Neil is making, is that, uh, or was making, was that we really have a fantastic deal with the UN, with the EU. Uh, <laughs> sorry, sorry. That as well. Yes, <laughs> Um, the, our deal with the European Union at the moment um, is better than any other European country has. We have um, a deal which suits our economy superbly, um, and we should hang on to that because we will never get it back if we leave. To go back to the issue about um, the, the impact of the, European, of the euro on the European Union, I think that probably if you were to go back in time, all sorts of people would say, yes, we should have done this differently, and yes, we should have done that differently. But Neil is right. The impact has been, um, while it's difficult, to, pr to bring stability at a time which could have been catastrophic. And I know this from my family, um, Greek connections. Um, what could have happened to Greece had they not been part of the euro could have been so much worse. Um, so, yes, the euro has its problems, but actually they, there, there has been stability that has been brought right across Europe. Um, by that business of sticking together, supporting each other. We need to do it more, but it's much, much better than it would be if we were not part of that union. Um, to go back to your original question about whether we should join the Euro now, I think probably not, um, but, but, uh, but I would hope that we would one day. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and finally, if you like, on this particular question, Edmund, Edmund Fallon from the Brexit Party. Thank you. Um, does the Brexit Party have a policy to join the Euro? Absolutely no way. Not a surprise there. So no surprise there. Um, I do agree, however, with what the question has said about the uh, effect of the Euro on some of the southern European economies, particularly in Greece. I followed the whole of the Greek debt crisis whilst it was going on, and I think that the way that Greece was treated by the European Union um, is absolutely atrocious, and it has indeed led to exactly what you said, severe austerity reflected in real shortening of real people's lives. Um, and it's a very bad effect, and of course it comes from the fact that they had external debt, sovereign debt, denominated in a currency that they did not control. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Edmund. I promise the lady down the front there question. We'll take her next. Also, we'll do a couple of other questions as well before we finish. We'll, if you want to broaden it out from uh, uh, the economy, then I'll allow you to do so. But uh, uh, the lady who, by the looks of things, could be supporting the Greens. <laughs> <laughs> um, everybody, uh, most people at the table have 
have talked about growth and I get the impression that you think that growth is something that we need um, for our economy. So, in terms of one planet living, if you were elected as an MEP, how would your party begin to work towards reducing growth and consumerism in the population? And what sort of growth would you think was a positive type of growth, the sustainable growth? Um, you know, I mean, the example I could give is the New Green Deal. I haven't heard any of you mention that so far. So, but the most important thing to me is when is your party going to begin to work towards uh, reducing growth and consumerism? Thanks very much. Um, it's a it's a difficult question um, in a number of uh, in a number of ways. But let me uh, set it out like this: in the context of uh, economic development and in lifting people out of poverty throughout uh, the world, the most successful system that we have developed so far has been the capitalist system. Now. We can um, focus on particular areas which are of concern in terms of uh, consumerism and uh, amateuristic behaviour. I certainly, certainly support that. But in terms of uh, distribution of wealth within this country and bringing up the overall standard of living, you know, firstly I'd say we've, you know, despite all of the challenges that we face at the moment, we've really never had it so good as we do in this country. Um, <laughs> You may disagree, but if you look back at through history, like any, any, any objective measure, life expectancy, average incomes, food the, the, stand, food the standard, food 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 you can argue about food banks, but the, the vast majority of people in this country are in a better condition than they would be. Go back through history, look even back to the Victorian times, earlier than that, the, even back to the 1940s. It's very clear that the standard of living in this day, these days, is much better than it was at any point previously in history. Now that's been driven by the society and the system that we operate in this country, which is a capitalist consumer society. Now I totally accept the point around some of the aspects of that and uh, the idea of this disposable fashion, for example, which is just atrocious in my opinion. Um, the idea that you need to upgrade your mobile phone every 12 months or 24 months, no thank you very much. But cars that are built on cycles where you need to upgrade your car every so often to get the new features when in reality they could probably put most of those features in today. These are all extreme uh, challenges for this country. We need to be looking at investing in long-term, uh, sustainable development in all of those areas, in all of the areas of the economy. But overall, I think we can be thankful for the situation that we're in today and look forward with optimism and Thank you, Tom. The future. Thank you. And uh, also, I'd like to have Alvin on this, please, as well, Labour. Um, I think one would have known the test of Western capitalism is it's based purely on consumption. And it's consumerism. It's we, uh, uh, we buy goods from China, bring it over from China, buy the purchase it, and we throw it away and it's all the back to China. And that is frankly not sustainable. Uh, because it's just not just only just the goods, but also food, uh, food production. We're going to have to move away from that. Um, we're going to have to demand at some point. We're going to have to pay some tax costs about we can't consume whatever we want uh, and feel like it. Uh, so we do need to acknowledge that and need to encourage people like you and myself to basically use that, we that, uh, use us. Um, I would say that all growth is comparable. We are a service economy in this country. Uh, a lot of the uh, provides financial services, but like by um, social services, all these services um, that provide to people here and across the entire world. Um, we can still grow, it can still grow, um, but it can manage to grow. Thank you, Albert. Um, I'll, yeah, quickly, Lucy, and then uh, then to her. Um, so I think that there is a, a real division between consumerism and growth, and I think we would all agree that um, we all need to have less stuff. Um, I would love my house to have less stuff. Uh, it would be, um, but there is a huge difference between that and 
growth in, um, I, I would like to see much more insulation of houses, growth in the sector of insulating houses, a thoroughly good thing. I would actually really, really like to see more education, more spending on education, more people able to... their lives, be able to um, afford to be able to take some time out later in life in order to learn new skills. Um, I think there are areas of growth and areas um, where it can be incredibly positive and I wouldn't want us to, to be saying we have to stop our economy um, in order to make it sustainable. We have to try and work out how to have a sustainable economy and that does mean growth but it means the right kind of growth. Thank you. <laughs> in the UK, life expectancy has actually not just stopped but dropped in the last couple of years. The only of the EU countries. So the type of person I was talking about is that you should be able to normally function until the end of your life. And this approach that can be right after the therapy for one to replace GDP based growth measures with capabilities. So you have to keep it smart as well. And the first one of those fundamental capabilities that we should be able to provide on these wishes would be to live healthily till the end of your life, reason. And this is not given these, these days, but the science is there to enable this, but the politics is not right now. So that's the first one of I'm talking about. So you can do all your stuff while you're able to stop. And uh, that one actually was coming, but just, just very quickly. Um, yes, uh, so the Green New Deal was mentioned, and obviously that is a, a Green Party policy and was promoted by us uh, a long time ago and is uh, one of our EU policies. Uh, that doesn't mean uh, growth in every uh, aspect, but transferring our um, economy towards uh, green jobs rather than uh, the kind of jobs that uh, we have had in the past. But one thing to bear in mind is that all the uh, appearance of uh, wonderful um, conditions that we live under in this country is premised upon the fact that we have hidden out of sight workers who are being exploited and resources that are being exploited in faraway countries where they don't have much life expectancy and they don't have uh, anything to look forward to or enjoy. So we are in fact a slave society uh, in, a, in a way that we can't see because we keep the wealth here and uh, deprive others of it. Uh, I am uh, an expert in the ancient world. In the ancient world there was no growth and no capitalism, but some of the best achievements, the most wonderful art, the most wonderful philosophy, and the most wonderful uh, intellectual pursuits. It's perfectly possible to have those things on a finite planet, and we don't need to be digging up coal in order to do it. Thanks very much, Catherine. Now, we have a small amount of time there, so I'm going to try and keep answers and questions short. So, uh, there is a gentleman there, yes, you're still there, a gentleman in the blue shirt next to one of the pillars, which is possibly uh, quite, quite challenging to get a microphone to you, but we will do it. Uh, so. Hi, uh, I've got sort of two questions, but I'll ask one. Just the one, please, if you don't Just mind, sorry. Um, we're either going to leave the EU or we're going to remain in the EU. How would the candidates bring the country together, whichever uh, situation you get into? Oh, yeah. Very quick answers, if you don't mind. I'll start. I uh, can't go down the line on this one, but uh, 30 seconds only, I'm afraid. Um, how we bring the country together? Steve Dagley, you can. <laughs> Try and forget the past divisions. It isn't easy, I'm well aware of that. We had a civil war in this country about 400 years ago. <laughs> the the wounds lasted a long time. It isn't an easy solution. What I like to think is that we will all get behind our sporting teams. That certainly helps. <laughs> I look, at, I look at Ireland, a divided country, the north and the south now play rugby together, they play cricket together, and I... But it, it's a good question, and scars take time to heal. Uh, thank you, Stuart. Uh, Lucy, uh, that's like a full of depth. 
Thank you. Um, one of the reasons why I think it's so important that we stop this Brexit mess now is that there are so many issues that need dealing with in this country and we are not going to be able to deal with them while we continue to have this endless uncertainty about our economic future. Um, actually, we need to get back to dealing with um, education, with our hospitals, with our roads, and it is by dealing with those issues that we will bring the country back together. Um, whatever happens um, in terms of leaving or remaining, there is going to be a proportion of the population which is furious about it. Um, and we have to recognise that that's going to be the case whichever way this goes. Um, but in order to bring people together, we have to deal with the rest of our politics. Um, and we have to bring communities back together. And that is one of the things that Brexit has been appalling for. It has driven communities apart. It's driven families apart. We have to stop it. Thank you, Lucy. Uh, I think our reason why people go to Brexit is basically because they felt ignored and left behind by the political establishment. Um, frankly, a lot of us do that we had stereotypes for the last 20 years. Uh, so for me, um, I want to make government and I want to have investments in our services, in our public and in our, in our communities. Only by actually investing and having a pride in our country can actually achieve the impact of Thank you. Thank you, Brothers. I have to move into the two political goals, something that's going to unite us. It's something that is going to be working for current generations and even more so for further generations. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we don't say bollocks to anybody. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, we don't say bollocks to anybody. Uh, there were very important reasons why people voted to leave. And we are going around and listening to what people have to say and the reasons why they uh, were wanting to leave. Uh, as Alvin says, uh, austerity and being left behind and the inequalities of wealth, these are the things that we are going uh, to address that uh, it's, it's to do with um, the uh, power of the austerity programme and of the super rich and uh, we need to uh, address the causes of Brexit uh, and not just tell them that they were all stupid. I have many, many levers in my uh, uh, part of the woods that I've been visiting. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, we are going to listen to them. Thank you. Um, Tom Thank you very much. I think this is uh, quite possibly uh, one of the most important questions that we face this evening. Um, the, uh, you know, the fanciful answer would be to ban social media, um, stop people <laughs> ranting at each other on Facebook and Twitter. That would, that would be a good start. I think everybody in this room, if they could take one thing away from this, would maybe be a pledge to stop ranting at people on social media because it's not good for anybody's mental health, let alone your own. Um, beyond that, I think the, uh, one of the, some of the points that are being picked up here are, are, are very good ones that I would certainly support. I think um, trying to generate a sense of pride in our country, um, that would be uh, extremely important, Something you know, a, a sense of something that we can all get behind. Um, reaching out and making sure that we're engaging, making sure that communities that feel that they're left behind no longer feel like that. A lot of communities, particularly up north, um, feel that all of the investment happens in the southeast and uh, that uh, the UK doesn't work for them. So things like, for example, re-examining how HS2 works, uh, potentially looking to can it in the south. Thank you, Tom. Do the investment in the north. Those types of uh, significant infrastructure uh, projects that bring the whole country together. Thank you. And to Neil, please. We need leadership with courage and vision to deal with the issues that we have actually got uh, in our country. That's the real answer. And they need to be uh, people who actually understand what those problems are. The gross regional disparity we have between what the poorest and richest region. The fact that we have communities stuffed full of people who are badly educated with no aspiration and no hope. Those are the things we need to actually deal with. Because that's how we actually raise the game, by pointing out what can be done, not what can't be done. What really is a, kind of a description of a country that we feel comfortable with, but making sure everybody else feels com comfortable in that country. And it's about freedom of thinking, it's about freedom of attitude, and it's about, above all, understanding that the individual, wherever he or she happens to be, actually matters, actually counts. 
and deserves a fair slice of whatever economic cake that we have. And I think that is the vision that we need to articulate in the future, because it's about having an education system, first and foremost, in my Thank view, you, which equips the people to do that. Thank you very much, Steve. Uh, and finally, on this one, uh, Progressive Party, Edmund Forum. By celebrating the operation of the democratic principle, I think that the uh, ballot box, um, although some people seem to be sniggering about that, is one of the uh, most important contributions to uh, civilization. It is the way that um, inevitable differences between interest groups and society are settled, where the mechanism by which you have peaceful redress uh, of grievances. Um, and the Brexit genie, I'm afraid, is completely out of bottle already. Um, we've had a very clear result in the referendum, and uh, really, uh, I think if you get that to the other way, um, then uh, that is completely wrong. Um, and I'd include in that celebration those Remainers, whom, many of whom I have met, who say, well, they now think that uh, they will leave. Um, simply because they Democratic result must stand and must be upheld. Thank you very much, uh, Edmund. Now, the organisation which, of course, put us on its Cambridge stays, but we do have to go eventually, so um, <laughs> I'd better make one last question. The lady in the centre there, yes, you, ma'am, let's uh, get the microphone to her if we can. Last question, I'm, I'm optimistic it's going to be a good one. <laughs> no question. I'm a little bit torn what I was going to ask, but um, I'm, I'm just going to ask um, the Brexit party, is he happy having ex-revolutionary communist parties and candidates <laughs> who um, support the IRA and are on record supporting child abusers? Well, there are two parts uh, to that. Um, do you have such members? And if you do, are, are you happy with their views today? I think if you're talking about Claire Fox, she's yeah. issued her own um, personal statement on whether, whatever she may or may not have said uh, about the IRA. If you mean, am I um, happy to have somebody in the party who is on the uh, left wing of politics, then actually you'll find that that's one of the features of the Brexit party. There's a wide spectrum of former uh, political allegiances from left to right, as well as a wide spectrum of candidates, um, most of whom have not been uh, professional politicians and have come from all walks of life. Uh, thank you, Edmund. Uh, we do have to bring things to a close, I'm afraid. Hopefully, you might be able to grab one of your uh, candidates if you want to ask them a question directly uh, once we've wound things up. Uh, do stay in your seats, if you don't mind, just in case our engineering team... No, we're, we're good, this is good. So let me thank our candidates. Uh, Edmund Fordham for the Brexit Party, Neil Carmichael for Change UK, Tom McLean for the Conservatives, Catherine Rowett for the Greens,